What's up, everybody? My name is Godzi, and welcome back to another episode of Umaneko When They Cry Answers Arc. Last episode, we continued with Chapter 6 as we were shown uh, Beatrice is revived, and you guys told me I should change her voice to be more high pitched and girly rather than her kind of cruel and crude English accent that I give the regular Beatrice, so alright, I'll make it more high-pitched. Not cutesy, probably. I, I'm i not gonna give her the Lambda Delta voice, but hi, more high-pitched for sure. I'd assume it should still be a little proper, but yeah. Also, you guys told me about the uh, Demon Twins, uh, who we still don't know their names. They just showed up and talked for a bit. Uh, yeah, apparently one's a dude. <laughs> it wasn't specified which, so... I can only assume that's probably, uh, it's probably important which one is actually a dude. Um, but yeah, I, I'd i assume it'd be the blue-haired one, since I was told they have a masculine voice, but I was told they also have a female seiyuu, so I don't know. It, it doesn't really matter, but, well, I'm sure it matters in some way. Uh, once we get around to actually seeing them, which... I'd assume would be later this chapter. Uh, I'm sure they'll explain a bit more about them. And uh, I also got one other comment, and yet again, it was, Without love, it cannot be seen. Well, without love, the truth cannot be seen. And I'm still not 100% sure exactly what that refers to, but I'm basically 100% convinced at this point that the culprit is... Uh, Shannon and Cannon. I I think both of them are the culprits. I don't know how exactly that would work with um the closed room ring in chapter 3. But otherwise, I th I'm pretty sure that would always work in every scenario. Uh What about with chapter 5 though? Would that work with Well, Hideyoshi's room tech yeah, the way Hideyoshi died in Chapter 5 is kind of iffy, but it's not Natsuhi, and supposedly only Natsuhi could have done it because the door was locked and the chain was set, meaning the door wasn't locked and the chain wasn't set, basically. So, yeah, I'm super suspicious of Shannon and Cannon. I don't think that necessarily means... Wait, I'm not still 100%. That it's them. I, I probably said that I'm 100% on them. I'm not 100%. Because there are intricacies. Like I said, the closed room ring. I don't understand how that would work. Um, the, the first game parlor still doesn't make much sense to me either. If no one disguised themselves as someone different. Which, the only way that that would have made sense is if Shannon disguised herself as somebody else. Or if she just simply faked her death. But then it was said that nobody faked their deaths, so I don't understand how that would work. Uh, the second and fourth games are easily explained with Shannon and Cannon. It's just the first and third that don't make much sense, but I, I'd assume they'll give me more clues. Maybe there was a third participant. Who knows? Either way, let's just continue. The boat carrying the relatives docked at the harbor. They left the boat one by one, making fun of Batler. <laughs> As they do. Goda wasn't the only one to greet them. Cannon was there too. Hmm. That's a difference. It has been quite some time, everyone. Allow me to welcome you to Rokanjima. I hope that your long journey went smoothly. Welcome to Rokanjima. Ah, good, good. Goda complimented Cannon in a whisper. Cannon ignored this, looking just a little sour, and continued to greet the incoming relatives. Hmm. Oh, George, been a while since I had to do your voice. Good thing it's not a difficult one to remember. Haha. <laughs> this is your first time meeting Goda and Cannon, isn't it, Battler? Ew! Oh, great. It's my first time meeting Battler, too! Well, I mean, not really, but... <laughs> Goda's a great chef. He's the only reason anyone would ever want to come to this island. I am most honored. Battler, I do hope that you look forward to your meals during your stay. I can't wait. I'm counting on you. Long time no see, Cannon. 
You seem to be in high spirits today. That's great. <laughs> Me in high spirits? I wouldn't say that ever. You think so? Hmm. Oh yes, your face is looking brighter today. Maybe it's your complexion, or maybe it's that your gaze looks a bit more gallant. <laughs> it must be a growing phase. That's how a boy becomes a man. You usually look as though you're about to pass out from anemia. You're a bit different today. You've got some spunk. A boy can change a lot in just three days. I guess this means even Cannon's getting a bit more manly. We aren't making fun of you, okay? We're all complimenting you. <laughs> Cannon had sworn to start changing the way he lived bit by bit. However, he had only meant to change within himself, and hadn't expected that it would show on the outside. He was a bit shocked to hear that his expression had changed so much, that people had apparently noticed as soon as he opened his mouth. Hmm. No. Maybe the real surprise was that his normal expression must have looked so incredibly sullen in comparison. Goto led the way up to the guest house. Cannon brought up the rear, helping to carry some of Kumasawa's shopping. Does my face really look that bright today? Ha ha ha! It looks that way to me as well! Did something good happen? <laughs> Even Kumasawa was saying it. Cannon, unable to see what his own face looked like, hung his head in embarrassment. Hmm. It is odd to see Cannon actually greet them. But... Either way, it's like Cannon and Shannon never greet them. It's always a Gota. Well, Genji doesn't greet them either. I guess it's just because they're... The servants with the one-winged e eagle thing carved... Well, on their clothes. Or in Shannon's case, her leg. When they reached the Rose Garden, they could see the others streaming into the guest house. Then, he saw Jessica running towards him from there. Is even Milady Jessica going to say that I'm in a good mood today? Cannon hung his head even deeper. And so, almost as though he couldn't control himself, Cannon spoke first. Do I really look that different? Huh? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, you aren't usually the type to come out and say hello of your own accord. That's probably why everyone was surprised. I apologize for not going with you earlier, milady. Huh? Oh, don't worry about that. I'm the one who's sorry for asking you to come all the way out to Nijima with me to meet everyone. I know how busy you must be today. I didn't have anything in particular to do. You were just so dazzling. So dazzling that I couldn't bear to be with you. I was just weak. Jessica faltered, uncertain what Cannon was talking about. However, she realized that this was something too important to be laughed off. Did something happen, Cannon? Shannon says she's going to get married. I see. So George is going to propose this time after all. Hmm. Jessica thought Cannon was sad because Shannon would be leaving, that this new mental state had caused the change, his, the change in his behavior. And Cannon realized that Jessica was probably thinking this. So he spoke to her clear, clearly and honestly, because he wanted her to know. I decided that I would stop working here if Shannon ever quit. I know. So are you going to quit too, Cannon? I'm not sure anymore. I feel that if I quit, I might lose sight again of something you revealed to me, shining like the sun. Jessica could only stare blankly, unable to understand what he was saying. However, she did realize that he was trying to tell her something important. And so she was able to accept that his next words were neither a lie nor a joke. Hmm. Lady Jessica, I love you. Wow, for once, Cannon is being forward. I, I love you too. You live your life like the sun, and I want to try walking that path alongside you. I have a feeling that, with you, I'll be able to break free from the me that I despise as furniture. You aren't furniture, Cannon, and you weren't born just so you could become a servant. A boy your age should be enjoying life much, much more. <laughs> I'm dazzled too. You're so dazzling I can hardly see. This is how I truly feel. I'm sorry for trying to hide it for so long. 
I apologize for hurting you on that day, in my cowardice. That's okay. Just hearing you say that makes me happy. So, since I want to always be with you, I plan to stop being furniture. I ask that you give me some time to do that. Please forgive this last bit of weakness. There's nothing weak about you! You've shown me... You've shown me that you have the incredible courage to change yourself from the way you used to be! So I'll support you until the end, and I won't rush you until you're ready. If I'm the sun lighting your path, that's because I wanted to shine more brightly than anyone else, so that you'd look only at me. Without you, there's no way I'd become anything like a sun. So I'll wait, no matter how long it takes. Thank you, milady. Milady is a bit stiff, don't you think? May I call you by your name? Sure. Oh, but only when we're alone, okay? Otherwise, it might make things tough for you. Good point. Shannon and George are doing the same, it seems. Hm. If Shannon hadn't been about to get engaged, you wouldn't have said what you just what you said just now, right? Cannon hung his head at a loss for words for some time. But it was true. If Shannon hadn't told him about the engagement, he probably wouldn't have been having this conversation at this moment. Yes. Because of that, I was able to think long and hard. Ah, come on. You heard about Shannon, and you wanted to see what love felt like yourself, right? Yes. That's a pretty straight answer. Well, when I watched those two... I was pretty jealous myself. In truth, it wasn't quite like that for either of them. They'd been shown the courage needed to speak up and tell the one you love how you feel. That's what pushed both Cannon and Jessica forward. So, what should I call you? Jessica works fine. Just saying it like that would be a bit embarrassing. Then you can use San, at least at first. Why not try it out? Come on. J Jessica. Good, that'll do for now. And I'd like to call you by your name, Cannon. You have a real name besides Cannon, don't you? Oh yeah, he does, and he never told us it. I'll bet it has the character, I don't know what that is, in it, like Cannon does. What could it be? <laughs> My name is Yoshia. Oh, he's actually telling us. Oh, how is it written? Jessica tried tracing out various characters on the palm of her hand. Then Cannon used his own finger to write out his name on her hand. You write it as... that. Oh wait, he said that. You write it as this. So you're... Yoshia. Yeah, that's a great name. Totally better than my weird name. That's not true. But Lady Jessica has a wonderful ne- Hey, say it again! Huh? Lady Jessica has... One more time! M Lady Jessica has a wonderful... Um, is something wrong? <laughs> no big deal. Thanks, Yoshia. The red, red flowers of the Rose Garden seemed to celebrate the two lovers whose feelings had finally connected. The scene was watched by one not human, who gazed out quietly from beneath the Rose Garden arbor. One not human. Oh, Golden Land. Okay, so this is, uh, the new Beatrice. I need to give you a higher-pitched voice. Come to think of it, those two had never called each other by their names until now. Jessica hadn't known Cannon's true name. Cannon hadn't called Jessica by her name. When people call each other by name, they acknowledge the worth of the other's soul. That's why names are sacred. When you've been given permission to say someone's name, it means they've acknowledged your soul. Is that why Father wants me to call him by his name? No, that's probably wrong. When Father sees me, it reminds him of that other me, the past me, and I'm sure that me called Father by name. However, that probably doesn't mean Father would be happy to hear me call him by his name. After all, I am me and not the Beatrice father knows well. What can I do to help father? How can I be useful to him? After all, that's the only reason I was born. 
Hanging her head, Beatrice sat all alone in the Golden Lands Arbor next to the Rose Garden. And she was watched by the Witch of Theater going and her Miko as they sat across from each other. Okay. Poor kid. I never thought I'd see you feel compassion for Beato. It'd be too cruel to call this Beato and the former Beato the same person. They're completely different people. It may be that, by the rules, this Beato is THE Beato. However, saying that would be horribly unfair to her. Bettner must be very depressed to have things end up this way after reviving his former rival. I sort of get Bettner's despair, but I can understand how this kid feels too. No person can become a replacement for another. Not even a past version of that same person. Compared to the young boy and girl who had found new versions of themselves by calling each other by their true names, this witch looked very feeble. The witch knew that she was an illusion created in the image of the person she once was. And she also knew that it would only hurt Batware if she were to try and pretend to be that person. And despite all of that, this Beato wants to be useful to Battler. How admirable. Is that the purpose for the witch known as Beatrice? That is what she claims. She says that she was created to be of service to Battler. So, a Beato who was born for Batler's sake eventually commits a serial murder, and drags Batler into a bizarre game that she calls Eternal Torture. I did not mean to right click. I don't get it. I believe you also understand that one can become a different person over a thousand years. Hell, over a month they can. Over a day, over a minute. At the very least, Beatrice was once a pure creature who was born for Batler's sake. It's also very clear that, in her current feeble state, she doesn't possess any of the courage or motivation needed to bring about such fearsome serial murders. Oh yeah, speaking of that, I was thinking, like, slightly throughout this uh, episode so far, that I'm... I have a problem already with uh, Shannon and Cannon being the culprits. Uh, Shannon has a possible motive, being Batler's sin, because I do remember it was specified one time uh, that Batler promised, like, six years ago, he promised Shannon that he was going to come back for her on a horse or something, and then he never did. I think that would work well enough to be a motive, even though Shannon was, like, 12 then, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that would make a 12-year-old plan to kill their entire family the next time uh, Batwer comes around, and Cannon wasn't there either at that time. So, although Shannon has a potential motive there, what the heck would Cannon's motive be? Yeah, like it matters. Well, yeah, it does matter. <laughs> that means the Sinister Witch we all know must have changed during the thousand years since her birth. Hmm. We keep getting this thousand years business. But I get the feeling that those words are just a metaphor for a really long time in the world of witches. As you get closer to the world of gods, the concept of time becomes increasingly vague. Six years can become a thousand. Specifically six. And a thousand years can be nothing more than a quick nap. One can fit in eternity long enough to be deserving of the title Hundred Year Old Witch in a mere two weeks. I see. In other words, the pure Beato transformed into the cruel Beato during six years that could be called a thousand. So, does that mean something bad happened during those six years that made her hate Batler? It's totally sh Yeah. Th that's gotta be referring to Shannon. I don't think there's anybody else that, uh, Batler said- gave some promise to that he broke six years ago. I mean, there might have been somebody, but I- I don't remember. Shannon's the only one that stands out because I've been suspicious of her since the first game. That doesn't make sense. During those six years, Batwer not only stayed away from Rokunjima, he even stopped using the Ushiromiya name. He had nothing to do with that change. Her hatred has got to be totally misguided. It may not even be that she hated Batwer. Could have been something else. Hmm. That's the Kuidorian, I believe. Oh, so this is where you were. Shall I make you some black tea? Kumasawa, 
There's something I'd like to know. Ha ha ha! Very well, what is it? My name is Beatrice, isn't it? Yes, that is correct. You are Beatrice, my lady. However, the Beatrice that father talks about isn't me. Well... I think father wanted me to be that person. I think that might be why. He was disappointed. Because no matter how much I looked like her, I am a different person. That isn't true. You are you, Beatrice herself. You have merely lost your memory of the past after being newly reborn. Even without your memory, you are still Beatrice. You are the same person whom the Master loves. So then, how can I regain those memories? Well... Hmm. Beto looked at Kumasawa with hopeful eyes, as though praying that she would tell her the way. Kumasawa averted her gaze unhelpfully, as though trying to say that she'd like to if only such a way existed. Hmm. If I can't regain those memories, can't you at least tell me what kind of person the Beatrice father loved was? That much I can tell you, but... I was born for father's sake, so I want to become the golden witch Beatrice that father desires. Beatrice. I could not use magic. However, if the witch father desires could use it, then I will learn. I want to become the witch he desires. That's the only way I can repay father for creating me. Hmm. That's admirable. Without the thousand years gone wrong, she really is an incredible kid. A chick of a witch. Very interesting. I've taken a liking to her, Angie. I shall allow this chick to make use of my library. Let us open the door that leads back to the world of witches. So you're going to make her read aloud the stories about her previous self? Yes, I want to know too. The creation story of the Golden Witch Beatrice. Hmm. Very well. If you wish it, then let us open the door once more. Kumasawa. A golden splash welled up around them. It was a cloud of gold butterflies. I was about to say, there's got to be some parallel here because there's already the parallel with Kumasawa and Virgilia. I think that this scene right here is trying to tell us something other than this new Beatrice uh, and, and her relationship with Battler. I think there's also meant to be a parallel here between the human Beatrice and Kenzo. But the thing is, how old was that Beatrice? Well, that was when Rosa was young, because there was that whole thing in, I think, Chapter 3, with, uh, like, the whole scene with, uh, young Rosa finding the Kuidorian, finding human Beatrice, and then that Beatrice dying. So that was a while ago, so that Beatrice is dead. But that Beatrice wouldn't have been the culprit either, because she's dead. Was there a second Beatrice? Because that parallel would make sense if there was a second Beatrice after the uh, human Beatrice died. Because Kinzo undoubtedly found out that that Beatrice died. And this parallel would make sense if he somehow... I don't know, created, if that makes any sense, a new Beatrice that is too different from the old one so he doesn't love her anymore, or he kind of despises her because she rem she reminds him so much of the old one without being the old one, without being anything like the old one, aside from appearance. I don't know, that would work, but... How true could that possibly be if there was a second human Beatrice? I mean, there hasn't- has there been a clue that there would have been a second human Beatrice? I don't want to just jump to conclusions, because... If we just throw clues out of the water, you can bullshit anything. There are two Kumasawas. <laughs> like, seriously. With a flash of gold, the form of the old lady transformed into that of a witch in a dress. You must choose the path that you are to walk down. 
Let us call it a path of roses. The beautifully blooming roses may encourage you, and their thorns may torment you. But even so, it is a path that you've walked down before. You may pass through the same thousand years. You may pass through a different thousand years. If you wish, you may even return back the way you came. I'll move on forward. I don't want to spend a thousand years in this garden drinking tea. I, Beatrice, was born for father's sake. So I want to live for father's sake. Please tell me about the Golden Witch. Hmm. The Great Witch spread her arms, communicating the other's unbending determination to the brilliant heavens. At that moment, a brilliant light covered the two of them, and before they knew it, they were in a strange study. Hmm. Yep, this is Featherin's place. There sat the master of this library, the great old witch, and her Miko. Virgilia gave a deep and elegant bow. It is the greatest of honors to be in your presence, Lady Featherin Augustus Aurora, the majestic witch of theater-going, drama, and spectating. Raise your head, child of man. I shall give that child the privilege of using my library, however she likes for a time. Angie, my Miko, you will see to her needs. Sure, sure, as you wish, my master. You know, you could just say, let me read your story. Miko of the Witch of Theater going, I leave Beatrice in your care. Pleased to meet you. <laughs> the Beatrice you're trying to become was suffering from something in her own way. At the very least, you've been released from that for the time being. Will you really go on a journey to regain those shackles? Yes, I want to become the Golden Witch. That is the reason I was born. I, the Endless and Finite Witch, Publius Virgilia Morrow. Is that your whole name? <laughs> Ask that you make her journey through Purgatory a pleasant one, granting her your protection. Oh yeah, also speaking of full names, um... Should be on the second page, third page here. Yeah, uh, Featherin here. Uh, I didn't mention this last episode, but two episodes ago, I noted how much, uh, Featherin's clothes here and the ring around her head make her look a lot like Hanyu. And <laughs> I got two comments that referred to her as Ow Ow, A U A U, and one is Ow Aurora. Which, I remember Hanyu always made that ow ow sound, so, yeah, I think that is an intentional parallel, and that's pretty smart, honestly. That's pretty cool. Huh? Oh, uh, let it be known that the, that as the Miko of the Witch of Theater going, and as the Endless Witch and Apprentice Witch of Resurrection, I, Angie Beatrice, do humbly accede to your request, or whatever. <laughs> Featherin snorted. So, you also bear the name of Beatrice? That's right. I know a lot about you. I forgot she did get the name of Beatrice from Eva, didn't she? Well, was it from Beatrice? I Eva? I don't remember. She got it somehow. <laughs> Please teach me. What kind of person was I? <laughs> well, first off, you sucked. <laughs> but at the same time, you didn't really suck. It's hard to describe. Sure. And I want you to teach me. Why did you become the person you were? Hmm. In this library, the fragments showing the tales of all your games up until now are stored as books. By reading them, you should be able to learn everything that has happened before now. By reading them, can I become a golden witch? To become a golden witch, one must solve the epitaph of the gold, and this trial cannot be skipped, not even by Beatrice herself. I'll do my best, so please, let me read the books in this library. As admirable as ever, why are you so set on ending up like that again? I do not know what I was like then, however, if that me can be of use to father, I want to become it. Angie sighed resignedly. No, no voice would... No words would stop this girl's feelings of respect. 
Angie was the Miko of the Witch of Theater going. She could do nothing but watch over the stage. What does Miko even mean? Like, reader? That's right. They weren't actually interfering with the play. This was just a bit of directing to shine the spotlight onto the tale of Beato's past. Even this was nothing more than the Witch of Theater going watching a play. If you read, you will learn what kind of person the old Beatrice was. However, you must decide what you will take from that experience. You are free to stay in this library, or leave it, or even return to it again later. In exchange, I will watch your play. You'll watch my play? Basically, it means you can do whatever you want. Thank you very much. I got... Um... <laughs> she likes it when you call her Featherin. Thank you very much, Featherin. Hmm. After being welcomed in by Featherin, Beato left on a journey to discover herself. Hmm. That tale connected the old tale with the new one. It wove them together. The thousand-year-old tale about her returned to its starting point, becoming a snake eating its own tail. Ooh. Spirals. The ring of that snake began slowly, bit by bit, to turn into the shape of a small island floating on the sea. And that was Rokanjima. The thousand years of the witch born on this island were tied to the island. Was it a thousand years, or just six? Or did this tale start even further back into the past? Beatrice went, on a went out on a journey to find herself. Hmm. Thunder. Tidal wave. Or just big wave. So what's going on? Clouds. The wind had been strengthening since a while back. Oh, we're just back to the island in general. The breaking waves had grown fierce. The ferry boats probably wouldn't be coming for a while now. The crashing thunder told that the island had been sealed off from the outside world. A thick rain poured down, mocking the fools outdoors who had to rush pathetically to find shelter. No longer would anyone be able to leave this island, and no longer would anyone be able to reach this island. No one, unless blessed with a miracle. There was another flash of lightning. The retinas of all who saw it were filled with white. <laughs> and then the organ starts playing. As that white faded away, an eerie shadow pulled itself up amidst the raging waters of the beach. As though suddenly remembering to do so, it coughed violently several times filthily spitting out the seawater that had filled its stomach. She then tore apart the touch fastener of her life jacket and threw down the reason she had been able to float here without so much as a thank you. Oh, Erica's here again. Great. <laughs> Welcomed in by a storm, same as always. Very good. Yes, Come and entertain me, Battler. I was a, I was just about to wonder, is Erica gonna show up in this game as a human again too? And I guess that answers my question. She sure is. Is she gonna be the detective again? Probably. Hmm. I mean, it all depends on whether or not she sees magic or something unexplainable or not. Because if she does, she's not the detective. News of the Drifter, Fruto, Erica quickly spread across Rokanjima. And ding dong, she's here again. Uh, I think that's literally the same description she had in the fifth game. Kinzo's still shown, uh, like that. Oh yeah, after welcoming the guest known as Erica, the number returns to 18. That already implied Erica's coming back. Erica had been welcomed in politely. And it was decided that she would be treated as a guest until the typhoon passed. In the dining hall, Gota's wonderful dinner had ended, and everyone was relaxing and enjoying some after-dinner coffee and cheese. That's... that's a combination. <laughs> Apparently, Batward was a bit relieved that Erica had come and turned into a good scapegoat. 
It drove away some of the attention he'd been getting piled on him for after for finally coming back after six years. In fact, she turned out to be very talkative. When the conversation turned to a sophisticated discussion of the mystery genre, even the adults were drawn in. She was apparently so well versed that even Nanjo, who had a vast knowledge of the subject, was impressed. <laughs> Good point. A strange family in a western mansion on an isolated island during a storm. Now that we have a detective stopping by to take shelter from the rain, we've got all the major factors lined up. Have no fear. No matter how difficult the crime, I will solve it. You sure about that? <laughs> That's a detective's job. How reassuring. It almost sounds as though you want a bizarre crime to occur. I hope I don't have to play the part of the victim. <laughs> eh. Dear, you mustn't say such things. Well, the history of the human mystery genre is only about a century old. Its tricks and ideas are limited to a few recycled patterns. So there's nothing left to show. No matter what kind of impossible crimes or closed room murders might occur, it'll be nothing more than one of the same classes of tricks dressed up to look like something new. The only reason mysteries still make for popular books today is because self-proclaimed fans, those who work off piece together knowledge and who have hardly read any of the classics, mistakenly think that a classic trick they didn't know about, through lack of proper study, is actually something new and surprising. I'm in this picture and I don't like it. Everyone couldn't help but gape at this imposing, imposing claim. If an aged critic had said it, that would have been one thing. But to think that a young person like this could say it so boldly. Mystery is a genre that ended a half century ago. At least as far as I'm concerned. However, thanks to countless ignorant fools, I get to play my part as a detective. <laughs> By that argument, wouldn't it mean that romance was perfected back in Shakespeare's time? So everything after that isn't worth reading? Exactly. So, if you just read Romeo and Juliet, it's the same as having understood all of romance. Okay, sure. That's ridiculous. It's not like there's any need to read more books than everyone else just for its own sake. But on the other hand, you can't be so satisfied with just a few stories like that. Sticking to classics of the past and never reading anything new is a sign of excessive nostalgia, don't you think? That sounds to me like the excuse of an old person who can't be bothered to read more. Hmm. I see. I guess I'll need to read at least as much as you, or else I'd probably lose in an argument. <laughs> me? <laughs> I don't read books. <laughs> Batware chuckled, but Erica knew from the previous game that Batware was actually quite an avid reader. So his words felt like more of a challenge. If you're so confident in your reasoning abilities, you must be really good at quizzes and puzzles, right? How oh, right! Maria, didn't you bring a quiz book or something? Eh! Brought it! Realizing that Erica's arrogant statement had made the atmosphere a little more tense, George smoothly changed the subject. By now, it was more than clear that she wasn't the cute guest she had appeared to be. Maria pulled a book out of her bag that had quizzes and puzzles written on it and started reading them to everyone. It looked like it might turn into a peaceful quiz party, but of course, th that isn't what happened. As a credit to all her big talk, Erica managed an impressive ratio of correct and immediate answers. She took complete control, and her bragging began to escalate more and more. <laughs> George slightly regretted the choice he'd made when changing the subject. Hmm. The detective can technically die, right? Like, they don't have to survive till the end, do they? Because Batler died on the ninth Twilight of the third game, and he was the detective then. Granted, he wasn't killed by the main culprit. But, whatever. 106 matches. No need to even write a tournament chart for it. The question, how many matches would you need for a tournament with 107 teams, was answered instantly by Erica. This is less of a puzzle than it is a test of knowledge. There's a formula which shows that the number of matches is always the number of teams minus one. Well, if you just look at the example showing three matches for four teams, and seven matches for eight teams, it should be easy to figure out the pattern. Ew! Erica, that's awesome! <laughs> Erica's big sis, right? Say it. Eh, Erica, that's awesome. <laughs> 
Really impressive. So you don't call yourself a detective for nothing. <laughs> I couldn't very well act the part of the detective if I was incapable of handling puzzles of this sort. Incredible. I'm sure you'll be able to become a real detective in the future. Well, I'm pretty sure I already am one. The cousins all thought about the answers to the questions, but Erica always answered first. Rosa thought it was a bit rude for Erica to say the answers out loud while people were still thinking instead of keeping them to herself, but since Erica was a guest, she decided against mentioning it. In truth, Erica was perfectly aware of this when she answered the questions instantly. Each time, she would grin broadly, as though saying, You also haven't solved such an easy problem. <laughs> Erica's kind of a piece of shit. <laughs> I mean, that much is obvious by this point. A great detective like you really shouldn't really need to take these too seriously, right? Good point. Even though these are all just childish questions, I was getting a bit too serious. I'll take more care, so let's have the next question, please. Alright, I won't lose this time. Maria, next question. <laughs> um, you have one large piece of cheese. A single slice with a knife can split it into two parts. So what is the lowest number of slices you can make to cut it into eight parts? Hmm. Three. Right? Because you cut it in half, then you stack them on top of each other. Then you cut it in half again. And then you have quarters, then you stack them on top of each other again, and you cut it in half. Me smarty. Eh! Oh, I know this one. So I guess I'll stay quiet this time. <laughs> George, acting like the adult he was, set up a move that would prevent people from answering right away, even if they knew the answer. In effect, sending a warning to Erica. It seemed that Erica understood, and she averted her gaze, snorting derisively. To make eight pieces, four slices would be enough, right? That's dumb. <laughs> it would hardly be a puzzle if that was the answer. Eva, you just always have to jump on Nazi, don't you? Haha, <laughs> that's right. These are usually set up so that a s smaller number than you'd expect is the answer. But still, how exactly could it be done? Oh, got it, got it. You can only do this because it's cheese. True. If you tried to do it with a birthday cake, there'd be a huge fight. <laughs> That's right. You might be able to do this with cheese, but you'd never cut a cake like this. Huh? Huh? All of you know the answer. Damn it, am I the only one who doesn't? That work, come on. Oh, I've got it. Yeah, you've got to think three-dimensionally. Wait, even Jessica? I don't get it. What should I do? Is he faking it? Hehehehe, <laughs> <laughs> I know the answer. It's written right here. Hehehehe. <laughs> you didn't know the answer until you looked, right? <laughs> get it, Butler? I see. I understand it as well. This is something you can do because it is cheese. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even Dr. Nanjo gets it. Could it be? Am I the only one who doesn't get it? He's faking it so hard. He is so faking it. I'm sure even your brain could be as flexible as cheese if we cooked it a little, Batler. <laughs> it isn't something like use zero slices with a knife and break it apart with your hands, right? Of course not. It's impossible to cut this cheese with anything other than a knife. About to take out a sword, bitch. Let's go. Think of the cheese in three dimensions. If that's hard, it might be... It might help to draw a picture on a paper napkin. So, we have one large piece of cheese, right? Then we use a knife to make eight pieces. Can the knife only cut in a straight line? Yes, that's right. The knife only cuts in straight lines. Oh, but here's a hint. You can only cut in a straight line, but you're free to cut it wherever you want. Try thinking of a bunch of ways to stick it in. You should probably try to think out of the box a bit. Show us what you've got, Batware. You have a large piece of cheese. This is... Why is this so intense? It's a cheese riddle. <laughs> How many times must you cut it with a knife to make eight pieces? You could obviously do it in four cuts. Could it be done in even fewer cuts than that? Our hints so far point, at, point to it being possible specifically because it's cheese. If it was a birthday cake, you really wouldn't be allowed to do this. Because you shouldn't stack the birthday cake pieces. Cheese. Cheese. Something you can do you can do because it's cheese? Oh. Oh! I've got it! I've got it! 
I was totally tricked. This isn't something you could think up if your mind's all stiff and rigid. He was faking it, and he's trying to make fun of Erica, wasn't he? Seems like you finally hit on it. Hopefully it is. it actually is the right answer. It's impossible to cut the cheese with anything except the knife, right? The knife can only cut in a straight line, right? There aren't any other rules, right? Right? Ew. Not really. <laughs> Alright, then that's gotta be it. Whew, that was a tough one. Almost like a riddle. Because it was. <laughs> <laughs> you just gotta get beyond cutting straight down from the top all the time. Was my answer wrong? I'm gonna make four. If you cut it, like, through the middle horizontally, and then you cut straight down in the middle, that would make it four pieces. You make two cuts from the top to get four pieces. If you keep it like that and cut across the side, splitting it into upper and lower halves, you get four times... You get four times two equals eight pieces. Oh, well... That, that was similar to what I was thinking. So you're not allowed to stack the cheese? <laughs> My way would still work just because it's cheese, though. It's an answer you can't reach unless you think three-dimensionally. In other words, the correct answer is three. Huh? Really? I thought the correct answer was one. Ooh. Eh. <laughs> how, how do you get eight slices from one? <laughs> what kind of magic did you use? There's no way in the world you can manage it with one. <laughs> this isn't a riddle, it's just a normal math problem. Huh? Oh, really? I thought of the three-cut method right away, but I figured that was too easy. So I guess I tried to twist it too far. Bauer's answer is smaller than the one in the book. Is Bauer right? Yes, he is. Patler is right. The correct answer is one slice. Can you fuck off? How do you do that? Bat was, hap was happy that someone had confirmed his answer. However, at some point, Erica's face had lost its cheeriness. To think that a human other than myself would give the answer one, that'd be you of all people. Your answer was one too, Erica? I guess you were also thinking out of the box. After all, it would be truly foolish to simply assume you knew what shape it was after hearing that it was a piece of cheese. Are, are you fucking kidding me? Uh, <laughs> they're assuming it's not a, like a, a a square or a circle, but it's like some jagged shape. <laughs> and that one slice technically would cut it into eight because of the way it's shaped. <laughs> That's so stupid. That's impossible. Batwar got it wrong, didn't he? How could you cut it into eight pieces with less than three slices? How foolish, child of man. <laughs> It says to cut it into eight pieces, but nowhere does it say that they have to be of equal size. It's still impossible. Do you cut it with something other than a knife? The rules say that only the knife can cut it, and that the knife can only cut in a straight line. However, to turn it around, the rules do not say anything besides that. In fact, the shape of the cheese is never specified. It's so dumb. I see. When you all heard a large piece of cheese, you thought of a flat cylinder, like Camembert or something. I was thinking about sliced cheese, like the kind you might put on your toast for breakfast. Because, you know, full blocks of cheese you'd cut with a knife aren't something I come across that often. The shape of the cheese isn't specified in the rules. A mistake by the ones who made the book. I imagine that there's a picture of a flat cylinder of cheese there in Maria's book. Oh, there is. Right here. As Erica had guessed, the book er Maria held had an illustration of a piece of cheese just as Erica had described it. With cheese of this shape, three slices really would be the correct answer. You cut it in a plus pattern from the top to make four pieces. Then cut it from the side to double that and make eight pieces. However, since this illustration hadn't been shown, the interpretation of the cheese had been left to the answerer. That's right. At the moment the problem was started, no one said anything about how the cheese was shaped or how flexible it was. Exactly. It seemed that Batware was the more flexible one. When it comes to both brains and cheese. <laughs> <coughs> Erica, you have the weirdest fucking quotes. First intellectual rapist, then take that dead people. And now, it seems that Batware was the more flexible one when it comes to both brains and cheese. God damn it. 
I don't get it. How does making a slice cheese let you cut it into eight parts with a single knife slice? Why not try it with that paper napkin? Pretend it's sliced cheese. Oh. <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me? Sli- Okay. <laughs> Pieces of sliced cheese, like, or a big piece of cheese, you fucking folded it? <laughs> Stop. It's like this. You fold it accordion style. God damn it. How many times do you need to fold it to make eight sections? Six times. <laughs> then you just cut it in half. God damn it, that's so stupid. To fold it accordion style, you alternate between upward and downward folds. Once you've done this six times, it looks like the side of an accordion. This cheese thing has gone on for ten minutes, but whatever. With no- <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> With normal cheese, it'd break if you tried to fold it like this. But the rules say that this cheese can't break unless you use a knife, right? Uh, yes, no problems there. Uh, I'd assume Erica says this. Yes, no problems there. After all, this is magic cheese that can only be cut by a knife. <laughs> After folding it, if you start at the top and make a cut right down the middle... You're right. It would make eight parts. I don't know who's... I'm just gonna... I, I don't think it really matters who in particular is saying these, but whatever. Wait a second. The parts aren't all equal this way, right? All the questioner said was to cut it into eight pieces. They didn't say anything about them being equal. Well, if you change the way you fold it, it is possible to make them all equal sizes, but I wouldn't want to confuse you stiff-headed people with the explanation. <laughs> oh. Oh. For a while, everyone was stunned. Bauer had reached a far better answer than three by thinking of the problem as a riddle. Erica had already known both answers and had even spotted a mistake made by the book. The others could do nothing but stare at those two in surprise. Incredible! So we were the stiff-headed ones? What an utter defeat. You were thinking in three dimensions, but it looks like Batware and Erica were thinking in one dimension higher. <laughs> 4D chess, bitch! Giga brain move. Fold the cheese. It seems the game with the witch has toughened you up quite a lot. Puzzles without specified rules, in other words, all things not covered by the red truth, are left to the observer's interpretation. It's the most basic of methods for constructing gaps in the witch's closed rooms. What are you talking about? Is that a quote from some novel? <laughs> well, let's call it that for now, shall we? Anyway, I guess this means that everyone's brains are as stiff as rock-hard cheese. <laughs> Without any signs of restraint, Erica looked at everyone and laughed sarcastically. Only Maria didn't notice the venom in that laugh as she happily turned to the next page. <laughs> so what kind of riddle is this going to be now, and how the fuck are they going to fold the cheese here? Ugh! Then on to the next problem! You have three cups and six coins. Split up the coins so that... Split up the coins so that there's one coin in one cup, two coins in another cup, and three coins in the third cup. Ew! <laughs> Wait a sec, that's easy. Just stick one coin in the first cup, two in the next one, and three in the last one, and you're done. <laughs> However, can you do the same th I don't know who's saying this. Uh, whatever. However, can you do the same thing with only five coins? Ew! I'm good at guessing. <laughs> Here's another cliched problem. Don't tell me that you'll all need to waste several precious seconds on a problem like this. That was Erica. But now Erica was gazing around with an unpleasant look, acting in a manner that was completely inappropriate both for a guest and for someone of her age. She was no longer a guest who would be staying until the storm passed. She had transformed into an annoying guest who wouldn't leave until the storm passed. Everyone thought this, but they were unable to say it aloud. Ah, uh, oh, right. Speaking of problems with coins, I've heard that picking up coins is a good way of judging someone's skill with chopsticks. <laughs> I forgot, she's a, she loves chopsticks. CHOPSTICKS! Yes, chopsticks, that's right! Chopsticks are the most elegant utensil on the planet! Poking things and chopping them up with forks and knives is so barbaric! Chopsticks are the best! For me, using chopsticks is truly an art! Jessica was about to say, aren't chopsticks just sticks, but stopped herself just in time. 
She realized that it'd be best to let George take control for now. I have a coin here, so would you like to challenge me? I'm pretty good with chopsticks. That's right! We train George very well with those! <laughs> I don't understand how people can eat with two fucking rods, but okay. Indeed! Table manners are a window into one's upbringing. And Erica uses them quite well herself. I'll lend you some coins too. It'll probably be more fun with one of them. <laughs> so we're just gonna ignore the fucking cup riddle? Jessica, watch closely and learn. Damn it! Alright, let's go. Let's see who can move the most coins over to their plate. Bring it on! <laughs> Do you have to make that expression? Chapsticks! Chapsticks! <laughs> This time, George had steered the conversation into a good direction. Everyone else understood, and they helped to egg on this chopstick fight and change the subject. They were fully aware by now that Erica was extremely proud of her intelligence, and apparently she had the bad habit of using that to look down on other people. She spun her chopsticks around with the deft hand of a juggler, staring at the coins scattered on the table like a dog who had been told to stay after having a meal placed in front of it. This is so freaking weird. Meanwhile, outside the mansion, it is still raining. Oh. The unsettling sound of the wind had now blended in with the sound of rain, mimicking the howl of some monstrous beast. Just when it seemed to be crying out sadly, it would suddenly turn into a roar and rattle the window, striking up even more fear and unease within me. Oh! Oh, I see. It's back to this thing. Light from the hallway poured in through the thin crack of the slightly open door, and it seemed to carry with it laughter that was warm and happy, but very distant. I'm sure everyone's in the dining hall or somewhere, having a good time. I want to go there as soon as I can. I'm sure my family will be there. I hate being all alone in a place like this. Dad. Mom. I stubbornly tried again and again to get that door open. But the merciless chain just wouldn't let it open any further than that crack. Who is this? On the contrary, feeling this close to a way out had just made me more impatient. Gulping and, in and trying to ignore the fear lurking behind me, I quietly closed the door. The light coming out of the crack is just a trap. An iron shackle, making it look like I'm an inch away from freedom. Though that door will never actually open. Shackle. A shackle trapping me in here for all eternity. Hmm. I need to get out of this creepy room. As soon as possible. When I closed the door, all that filled the room were the eerie sounds of wind and rain. The way the wind picked up every now and then and shook the window frame felt like a monster in a cage shaking the bars. I was so scared of that monster I couldn't help but avert my gaze from the window. Hmm. Gotta search. If I can't get out the door, I need to find another way out. Just to the side of the door was a closet. There was only enough space inside to hang overcoats. Of course, it didn't connect to anywhere outside the room. If this were hide and seek, it'd probably be fun to hide in there. However, inside this creepy room, it'd be no better than stepping into my own coffin. If I go in there, maybe I'll find myself trapped in the closet next. This fear I didn't understand sent a massive shiver up my spine and I closed the closet door in a hurry. There's one door left. When I opened it, there was the bath and toilet. Of course there was no exit. There weren't even any windows. If I turned the faucet, water would probably come out, then disappear down the drain and flow outside. But I couldn't get out that way. Unless I went into the bathtub with the stopper pulled out of the drain and smashed my flesh and bones to bits. I had the feeling that this was the only way out. So the black stopper in the bathtub drain looked extremely terrifying. Last time someone went down the drain, they died. <laughs> I tried a lot of things, both mentally and physically, but there really was no chance of me getting out through the bathroom. Next is the window. Beyond the window is a pitch black darkness. The fierce winds and rain are slamming against the glass. The darkness on the other side of the window may have been unsettling, but I didn't really care where I went, as long as it got me out of this room. However, the window was clamped shut. Right down the middle of the window, which was made to swing open like a set of double doors, were several ugly metal clamps. 
It was even more unnerving than the chain on the door, like a rough operation scar on some bizarre monster. The wind and rain slammed against the window frame, shaking it and making it creak loudly. However, unlike the door, this wouldn't open even a crack. I've had enough. Give it a rest already. What the hell's going on with this room? I've had enough of this creepy room. Enough. 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 Enough! It's impossible to go outside except by the door and windows. And compared to that thick door, the window looks like it might be possible to break. I'll smash it. If I swing a chair at it, the glass will probably break. I might even be able to smash the wooden grid that runs through these latticed windows. All I need to do is make a gap large enough to slip out of. I grabbed a fancy looking antique chair and headed back to the window. Ah! Smash it. Over and over. The glass smashed with a violent sound and the frame groaned and creaked. Smash it. Smash it. Over and over. If I can just break through the wooden grid. Damn it. What the hell? Even though the glass had been smashed apart, even though the cold ring that blew in tormented me, I just couldn't get that grid to break. They weren't iron bars, it was just a slender wooden mesh. Even though it's fragile enough to make that creaking sound, why doesn't it break? Hmm. No wait, maybe it's almost broken. What if I try attacking it from a different angle instead of smash just smashing it head on? I suck my left hand outside through the hole in the broken latticed window. Grabbed the frame from the front with my right hand, and tried to break it by sm break it by shaking it around from both sides. My left hand started to grow ice cold from the frigid winds and rain. When I shook it, fragments of glass sticking out from the broken frame poked into me, and my wrist was soon stained with blood. But if I can just get out of here, this much pain is no big deal. But I can't get out. I'm stuck. It won't open. I can't break it. The more violently I shook the frame, the more g the glass fragments tore into my left wrist, causing me intense pain. Wait, what's... huh? Ow! Ow! Before I realized it, the glass fragments on the frame had extended outwards. It was as though an ugly beast was trying to chew my hand off with glass teeth. Motorcycle gun man! It didn't just feel as though they were growing outwards. They were actually getting longer before my very eyes. Uh, and they're chewing my hand to bits. I tried desperately to pull my hand out, but it had already dug deep into my wrist and I couldn't move it. I put all my strength into it, but it just hurt more and more and the glass didn't even budge. What the hell? Damn it, let go, let go, let go. I hit the glass with my right fist over and over, but that just hurt my right fist and did nothing to release my other hand. Just then, my left hand which was still exposed to the rain outside, brushed against something slimy. Ugh. What? It couldn't have been a leaf blown about by the winds or anything like that. I mean, it felt just like the touch of someone's rain-soaked hand. Then it closed tightly around my left hand. When I felt the five fingers, I knew that some person out in the darkness was touching my left hand. And, yes, I know who it is. It's the witch. The terrifying witch who rules over Rokenjima's night. The two hands soaked in the freezing rain, gently caressed my left hand. However, though I could tell what was happening by touch, I couldn't see anything out there in the darkness. Then, it felt about my fingers, and twisted my ring finger upwards. Ow! It's gonna break! Okay, the style of speech, saying ow 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 ow, and saying kya, and saying damn it a lot, is this battler? And then the thunder tells me, you'll never know. <laughs> At that moment, I saw something in the darkness for the first time. It was white. The darkness grinned and bared its white teeth. Then that mouth filled with eerily white teeth, approached my finger that had been twisted up so far it was about to break, and opened wide. <sighs> ah. It must have been laughing at me from the darkness. After all, that creepy mouth was twisting upward in a huge grin. I had a horrible idea of what it might be trying to do to my finger. A shiver ran up my spine. I resisted as much as I could, but the fangs of glass just wouldn't release my left hand. And then, it gently bit my finger. You say gently, and then it's just like, ah! Flesh and bone were crushed and torn apart in an instant. Crunch, rip, tear, squelch, splat.
Did you hear something just now? I think I heard it too. It sounded like a clunk. It's probably just the wind hitting a window. <laughs> this is a beat up old mansion after all. Yeah, it is pretty creepy. When I was a brat six years ago, I remember spending a lot of nights all scared that the witch really was walking around the mansion. Oh, she exists! Beatrice exists! What's at the other end of this hallway? Oh, hello, Shannon. There are guest rooms there, but they aren't being used now. Yeah, after all, we have the guest house now. Until then, we would always stay in these guest rooms. Yeah, I remember too. When I saw the guest house today, I was surprised at how beautiful it was. Well, that's because it was just built. I wish I could move my own room over there. Shannon, Erica's room is in the guest house too, right? Yes, we have prepared a room for her in the guest house. And since the guest house is a good distance away from the mansion, no matter what kind of trouble happens, you can't hear what's going on in one from the other. There are the phones, but those aren't always the most reliable. <laughs> are you still in detective mode? <laughs> Sounds like you'll be all bummed when we all wake up tomorrow and manage to say good morning to each other. <laughs> True. At least one of us had better be gone by tomorrow morning. Right. Uh, allow me to guide you all to the guest house. Okay. The adults were apparently about to begin a conversation that they didn't want the kids to hear. The real family conference was about to start. As the kids and Erica followed Shannon on their way to the guest house, they passed through the entrance hall. Looks like it's pouring down at its hardest right now. Should we watch TV in the parlor until it dies down a bit? Mama said to go back to the guest house. We have to go or she'll get mad. Ugh, and then she'll kill one of my rabbits again. I think we'll be able to ra relax a lot more over there. Better than getting to see and hear our parents get all pissed at us. <laughs> it looks like everything's falling into place. Erica giggled and opened the indiscreet look on her face. I'll go get some umbrellas for everyone. Please wait here. Oh, wait a second. It's been bugging me for a while. Who's the woman in that portrait? Well, to be honest, I already know that it's Beato's portrait. Still, we only just walked past it in the last game, which is no fun. Erica whispered to herself, but of course no one heard her. Hmm. This is the Master's Benefactor, Beatrice. They say she gave Grandfather a vast quantity of gold, meaning that she's to thank for the Ushiromiya family's revival. She's just a witch of Grandfather's delusions. Supposedly her ghost walks the corridors of the mansion every night. Hey, quit it. That story always freaked me out when I was little, and always made this mansion feel terrifying after night fell. Oh, right, that's true. What about now, six years later? I'd totally forgotten, but looking at this portrait head-on, I can feel that old fear coming back a bit. Eh, Beatrice isn't scary, at least as long as you respect her. If you don't... <laughs> right, Shannon? Uh, yes. That rumor does exist among the servants as well. Rumors about servants patrolling at night bumping into mysterious silhouettes or gold butterflies. Yeah, was it last year or the year before? Didn't one servant fall down some stairs and get so badly injured that they quit? Wasn't there a rumor that it was Beatrice's curse? <laughs> Jessica told it like a ghost story, trying to scare er Erica, but Erica just laughed disdainfully. Come on, that's creepy. It was probably just an accident, right? Just a coincidence? It happened just after Grandfather had this portrait hung here, so it was probably the year before last. In fact, if I remember, this here is the staircase that servant fell down, right? Yep. After all, this insanely huge portrait really stands out. Shortly after it was put up, everyone was talking about what it might be. And then when the accident happened, shortly afterwards, people started calling it Beatrice's Curse. That was probably Jessica talking. So these ghost stories about Beatrice started after the portrait was put on display? No, rumors about Beatrice's ghost walking about were around even before that. However, I do think those stories grew in number after that portrait was hung there. Before then, even though they had heard about the witch, Beatrice, they didn't have an actual distinct picture in their heads of what she'd be like. I imagine that this portrait made that picture distinct for them, strengthening the rumors even more. So, who started talking about this Beatrice witch in the first place? Grandfather. 
He'd always start freaking out and yelling, my beloved witch Beatrice. Well, until we saw that portrait, we had no idea what she looked like. It's no surprise that you'd get one or two ghost stories with a creepy portrait like this hanging around. You always find ghost stories cropping up around things like a portrait of Beethoven in the music room, or the statue of the school founder. True, it wouldn't be strange for a few ghost stories to arise in an old gloomy mansion with the sound of wind and rain present in the background for so long. Well, it's nothing more than a ghost story, a delusion, a fairy tale, worth less than the usual drivel of a half-sweeping nitwit. That was probably Erica. <laughs> Erica looked up at the portrait and smiled at it hostily. As though she felt that this smile was disrespectful to Beatel, Maria's face soured. Eh, Beatrice exists. If you say things like that, you'll definitely feel the curse of the witch. Oh, how frightening. Please curse me if you can, Beatrice. <laughs> <laughs> so, if we find you mysteriously dead next morning, we'll know it's the curtain raising on a witch's murder case. But you're a detective, right? Wouldn't killing the detective off in the beginning be a bit too radical? Ah, uh, that would be troubling. That would get in the way of my crime scene inspection. I see, after all, even the Knox rules don't prohibit the detective being killed. That is true. I have just what you need! It's a charm that'll protect you from Beatrice's curse! A charm? You have a charm for something like that? After fishing around in her bag, Maria pulled out a string of beads attached to a metal that had a scorpion drawn on it. Ah yeah, these. It looked like a cheap prize from an arcade or something. What are these? Eh! They're magic repelling charms! Their effect is very weak, but if you use them, you'll definitely be able to avoid Beatrice's curse all night long! I've heard that spider webs are also useful for repelling magic. Eh! That's probably because Beto is the incarnation of a butterfly! Huh? Wasn't it the evil spirits of- oh my god. A Kujikishima that were weak against that? Kumasawa knows a lot about that sort of thing. Witches. And evil spirits? <laughs> this is getting a bit interesting. Would you mind telling me about it in a bit more detail when we get to the guest house? Here are umbrellas for everyone. It's still raining very hard outside, so please take care. Shannon handed out the umbrellas she had brought. Everyone headed towards the exit. Hmm. And then, when there were none left standing in front of the portrait, a gold butterfly appeared. It expanded out into a golden splash, becoming a human form. In the hall, empty now that the children had left, Beato stood alone and silent, looking up at her own portrait. Hmm. Without a doubt, the figure depicted there was like her as an image in a mirror. However, it felt as though its eyes and expression were just a little different from hers. From her perspective, while the person in this portrait was almost infinitely close to herself, it was just as surely a different person entirely. Who are you? Please tell me what kind of person you are. Beto had already finished reading the fragments from Featherin's library, which showed the tales of all the games so far. You've already finished reading them? However, the witch called Beatrice, who had been depicted in them, had been so vastly different from her. At the very end, it had looked as though that witch and Batward connected just a little bit as rivals. But for the most part, Beatrice had just bullied and bullied Batward nearly all of the tales. Even though this was about her, she had no idea why Beatrice had tormented Batward so much when she had supposedly been born for Batward's sake. All she had learned from Featherin's library was that the former Beata was a completely different person who defied understanding. What happened to you? I'm an egg of you. A chick. Your wings should have existed for father's sake. Just when did you have one of those torn off, and end up so drastically different? She had listened to the conversation Batwar and the others had just been having. Beatrice can't handle scorpion charms? Beatrice can't deal with spider webs? She wouldn't have wanted to touch either of those by choice, but it wasn't as though anything terrible would happen if she did. Was being perfectly fine when around those proof that she wasn't Beatrice? Even though this involved her own self, she didn't understand at all. So she quietly gazed into her own eyes on the portrait. It felt as though the truth hid behind those eyes. Hmm. Beato slowly approached the portrait, and then she lightly touched it. Ba 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 ba. Oh my god. When she did, it felt as though the portrait rippled slightly. 
Yes. This is a doorway. Oh, holy shit. Ba, ba, ba. <laughs> a doorway to the long path that will lead her to the Golden Witch Beatrice. Banto felt a bit dizzy. She lost her balance, as though the world was twisting around her. Then, when she couldn't tell which way was up or down, she was swallowed downwards. Plunk. With a soft, watery sound, Banto was sucked into the portrait. <laughs> That'd be the perfect time to just show a star spinning around. Ba ba ba. <laughs> that joke shouldn't be so funny to me, but it is. The world inside the portrait was pitch black. However, there was nothing unsettling about it. It was a comfortable darkness, like when you put your head under the covers in bed at night. Beato realized this was a world inside herself. So despite the darkness, she felt a warm embrace. As long as she asked for nothing, this world would ask nothing of her. But she couldn't remain like this. She didn't want to spend eternity inside the darkness of this world. Yes, I need to hatch out of my egg. This darkness is the shell surrounding the gold butterfly called Beatrice. I will be born for father's sake. I will be born to live for father's sake and to serve him. She took her goal, her reason for being born, and put it in words. As if in response to those words, the seal on the shell began to melt away. Cracks appeared in the darkness, and a brilliant light enveloped the world. Whoa. Womp 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 womp. Huh? And so, Beatrice was born. Should I give her her regular voice again then? Huh? Hmm! Two? Two? There I stood, along with another me. For a second, I thought that the me in front of me was the real Beatrice, the one I wanted to be more like. However, she was looking back at me with the same bewildered eyes, so I realized that wasn't quite it. That's right. I wasn't the only one born from that egg. She was also born. There are two Beatrices now? Well, she's wearing, like, the human Beatrice's outfit. Is she my twin? No, it feels a bit different. How can I put it? Both of us are lacking something and immature. Yes, both of us are chicks, but we are also fragments of the true Beatrice. It felt as though we could become the real Beatrice together. No one explained this to us. However, we naturally understood. I decided to talk to this other me. Unless I get to know her and become one with her, I won't be able to become the Beatrice father desires. In other words, the thing that father wants from me, and, so was, and was so heartbroken to find missing, must be something that she has. Hello? <laughs> I see, so this is like... Kind Beatrice on the right, and this is angry Beatrice. The Beatrice with her ha hair down looked at me dubiously several times, then finally spoke. You're gonna... I I'm gonna give this one the same old Beatrice voice. Why is your face the same as my own? The true Beatrice also spoke in that manner. It looked like she really does have something that I lack. Well, I don't know why either. I am the Golden Witch Beatrice. And you are? I am also Beatrice. I was born for the purpose of serving Ushiromiya Battler. I am the Golden Witch and the ruler of Rukunjima's Knight. I know of Ushiromiya Battler, but I have trouble imagining why I should, why I should have to serve a brat like him. Ah. I realized that the thought I'd had a second ago must have been true. Together, we really can become the true Beatrice. Though the person in front of me does have the part that makes her a witch, which I lack, she does not possess the mission to live for Ushiromiya Battler's sake. She has what I do not, and I'm sure I have something she does not. We must be two and yet one single person. I think we're something like twins. No, that is not so. You are my little sister. I have been here since long before you were born. Huh? Is that so? I was born later. So does that mean the mission to live for Ushiromiya Batwar's sake was born later on? However, I don't think my whole existence is something quite as faint and intangible as a mission. I have enough of a personality to think and act as I am doing now. So to which Beato and I are separate people, with both of us possessing something the other lacks. In that sense, maybe it's fitting for us to call ourselves sisters, as she says. I want to know about you. 
I also wish to know. I understand that you are also me. Why is it that you speak that way? And why must you serve Battler? Until we grow to understand this, it seems both of us will remain immature. I want to become a complete Beatrice. Until you were born, I was complete. However, now that you have appeared, I believe that accepting you is my fate. I also wish to know about you. The witch Beato's tone was very slightly arrogant, which fitted her self-proclaimed status as the older sister. However, since we both realized that we were the same person, there was no need for her to be a bully. She probably realized that after meeting me, her current form was no longer her real self. Where are we? Is this the Hall of the Mansion? Oh. Yeah, I was about to mention, the portrait's not even there. Beato gasped. Her portrait wasn't there. Did that mean that this was at least two years in the past? Precisely, this is the Hall of the Ushromia Mansion. The night is my time, and the nighttime mansion is mine as well. That fool Kinzo is still so desperate to catch me or revive me. How truly ironic. Here I am, openly ruling the mansion every night. Yeah! So, what do you do here? I have lost my body, and due to the effects of that hateful shrine, I have no magical energy. However, my power is reviving bit by bit every day. I can't wait to eventually undergo a spectacular resurrection and have a good laugh at Kinzo. I can't wait to tell him that I've succeeded in escaping from his cage. Simply put, I'm a ghost killing time by wandering about night after night with nothing to look forward to besides teaching that old man a lesson. I just remembered something. As far as I remember, the only people who saw the human Beatrice in the second game, or Beatrice herself, in, on like the actual game board, Shannon and Cannon. I think Genji was implied to have met her, but he never technically did, on screen at least. I don't remember, and Kinzo of course was dead, so it doesn't really matter. Hmm. That's also interesting. May I join you? Of course! After all, you are a part of me! How could I left the le how can the left hand refuse the company of the right? Why should I refuse? I shall be pleased to have you, my little sister, the new Beatrice. Thank you very much. Sister. Somewhat embarrassing name, but it is not bad. Come, let us go. Let us take a walk through the nighttime mansion. <laughs> Let me introduce you to my boring everyday life. Hmm. The two Beatrices changed their forms into two gold butterflies, flitting silently into the depths of the shadowy mansion. Interesting. The fact that the, uh... New Beatrice refers to the old Beatrice as her older sister. There's yet another parallel with uh, Cannon and Shannon. Because Cannon refers to Shannon as his older sister. He got there a while after Shannon was already there. Was Shannon already acting as Beatrice and Cannon was learning to? I don't know. I'm still super suspicious of Shannon and Cannon, and I feel like there's something. That should be able to be known at this point that I'm missing, but... Eh, I'm... I was told that this, uh, episode 6, episode 7, and episode 8 are kinda just meant to be clues at this point to tell you... To teach you who the culprit is. So I'm hoping I eventually get it. I still think Shannon and Cannon are the most suspicious. But there are other characters who I've been suspicious of. I'm not suspicious of Gota anymore. But characters like George, Rosa, Nanjo I still think is an accomplice regardless, which, that's also right, I I still think Nanjo's a, a, an accomplice in each game. So, would that also fit? I don't know. And what would be the motive for Shannon and Cannon also killing each other? Because Cannon died on the second Twilight of the second game, which would mean Shannon would have had to kill him. Unless he killed himself, like he jumped out the window and hid in the bushes. Eh, whatever. I'm sure we'll get more coups as we go. But either way, kind of a longer episode today, but I'm sure nobody's really complaining. That's gonna be it for this episode, guys. 
If you liked it, be sure to press the like button, and if you didn't like it, fuck you too. Remember to subscribe, follow me on Twitter, and hit that notification bell to stay up to date on all my videos and stuff. And as always, my name is Godzi, and I will see you all next time. Goodbye!